Welcome everybody to Bitcoin Optech newsletter number 247 recap on Twitter spaces. Some quick introductions and then we'll jump into covering this newsletter. I'm Mike Schmidt. I'm a contributor at Optech and I'm also executive director at Brink where we fund open source Bitcoin developers. And Merch wasn't able to make it today, but the good news is Dave Harding was. So welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me, Mike. So I'm Dave Harding. I have been the primary author of the Optech newsletter for the past five years, and I'm also currently doing an update on the book Mastering Bitcoin, doing the third edition. Awesome. And we're joined by a special guest today, Dr. Maxim Orlovsky. Do you want to provide a quick introduction for the folks who may not be familiar with your work? Yes, sure. So I'm from LNPBP Standards Association, which is non-profit working on developing layer two and layer three protocols on top of Bitcoin. And one of the main things that we did over the last four years is RGB, which became a smart contracting layer or programmability layer for Bitcoin and Lightning. Well, thanks for joining us. And we can jump right into the newsletter in which we cover RGB and specifically a post, Maxim, that you sent to the Bitcoin dev mailing list. And I know that the newsletter write-up is covering this version 0.10 release um, and your post to the mailing list. And I think we can get into some of the details of that particular re release, but maybe taking a step back, you mentioned that you're part of the LNP BP group and RGB is one of the efforts within that group. Maybe you can just provide maybe a high-level overview of what is RGB. I think maybe some listeners are less familiar with it. I know that it's probably pretty common that folks maybe heard of some announcement of RGB a few years ago and maybe haven't heard about it since. So what is RGB? Yeah, sure. RGB appeared as an idea back in 2018 or maybe even earlier than that as a result of cooperation between Jack Amazuko and Peter Todd, who are well known in the Bitcoin sphere. Peter Todd proposed a new concept called client-side validation, the whole idea of which was that we need to move and we can move a lot of things out of blockchain. And by moving a lot of things out of blockchain, we can actually increase the scalability and privacy at the same time. Giacomo took that idea and he coined a term of RGB as a colored coins over lightning, which were made possible by this client-side validation idea. Literally meaning that let's take the idea of issuing assets on Bitcoin and Lightning Network and put it into client-side validation paradigm. And that's how RGB was born. Later, in 2019, I joined the team and together with Giacomo, we created this LNPPP association with the idea of bringing RGB into practice. And the end result was that uh, already in 2020, the RGB started transforming into uh, not just colored coin or assets, because nobody was happening about uh, just doing a layer for new shit coins on Bitcoin, but into a programmability layer for Bitcoin and Lightning Network, which may allow advanced forms of smart contracts and advanced forms of programmability, as well as increased privacy for Bitcoin operations. And we've been developing this through years and we had a number of iterations. And that last iteration you mentioned, which went live literally a week ago, allows full-fledged things. So anything that people are doing on the smart contracts on other blockchains, now possible to be done in Bitcoin and Lightning Network, but without the need of introduction of new tokens. So many things can be done with a pure Bitcoin and Lightning, which actually wasn't possible before. We went through an example in the newsletter right up about Alice and Bob and Carol and Dan issuing tokens and passing them around between themselves. Some examples being on-chain transfers and then also in the last example between Carol and Dan doing off-chain transfers. Can you maybe enlighten folks when these tokens are being exchanged off-chain? Is this using a separate protocol from Lightning? Is it a modified Lightning implementation? Or can, can you explain a little bit how that works for me? Yeah, I'll try. There is a number of things 
which are separate from each other, we need to go through in order to answer this question. The first thing that all the tokens, and not only tokens, but any form of the smart contract state, because many of the smart contracts, they do not operate with the tokens, they have different forms of the state. All this exists on the client side, meaning that it is kept by the client the same way as clients keep private keys or wallet descriptors. Meaning that if they lose their data, they will lose their assets and they will lose their smart contracts. So this is what client-side validation is about. Users keep this data and they share this data outside of blockchain. But by which means users share the data? Well, RGB doesn't care about that as a protocol. It is abstracted from the question of the way how the data are sent from one user to another user. And it is able to work with the different ways of sending the data. As of today, we are already have at least two of them. One is using some form of relay servers called RGB RPC. And the other one is based on Lightning Network, which allows us to share the data through the Lightning Network. We have created a dedicated protocol called Storm, which provides a data layer for Lightning, and it operates on top of the Lightning Network. And you can do that to send this data in a more decentralized fashion. Also, we think that it would be possible to share client-side validated data through Nostr or other systems. And at the end of the day, they can be sent between users as just the plain files inserted into emails or chat messages. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. In all follow up with something that you mentioned in your explanation, which is these different types of smart contracts that don't involve tokens. So I think our, our write-up involved tokens, but also noted that there's other use cases. I think folks are familiar maybe with colored coins and the fact that you can issue these tokens. What are some examples of use cases that you're excited about that don't involve additional tokens? I tried to cover the most exciting use cases for RGB in the very last answer in Bitcoin dev mail list. I will briefly go through that. The most exciting tokenless applications are the following. The first one is the digital identity. In the world of a web of trust, one of the main problems which wasn't fully solved was the procedure of key revocation. There was no way how somebody can revoke his key and afterwards that everybody are able to instantly see that fact and also prove that the key was indeed revoked. Because if the information about the key revocation is not published, it is impossible to detect this fact. With RGB and single-use seals, which are used by RGB, for now, the key revocation becomes fully provable and undeniable, meaning that once you revoke the key, it is known to the whole world, and it is also impossible to prove that the key wasn't revoked. This is, for example, one of the cases that RGB does without involvement of any tokens or even Bitcoin as a coin itself. Another example may be thought of a DAOs, which is decentralized autonomous organizations, also run in a tokenless way. And the DAO being a different voting rights, which can be executed by different people. And the difference of this DAO from any other DAO, that with RGB, you can prove that the whole history of the DAO operations is unique. You can't do that with the open timestamp type systems because when you do open timestamps, you can create alternative commitments. So while you can prove that something, some fact had a place in the past, you can't prove that an alternative fact haven't had a place in the past because you can create alternative commitments. With RGB, you can have a whole history of events which can be proven to be unique without any other alternative history. It reuses the same mechanism it uses to prevent a double spending. And the same mechanism is leveraged to create non-doubled histories of events. And that allows a new type of DAOs, which were not possible on Bitcoin ecosystem before. 
There are also many interesting financial applications not around RGB, like the whole area we call Bitcoin finance, which appears from the merge of RGB and Lightning Network, together with such things as a storm, which I mentioned before. Here, you may introduce some tokens, but these tokens would be more traditional forms of financial contracts like options, futures, which are quite crucial for any large economic systems. And you can organize trade with these tokens, including decentralized trade, decentralized exchange, creating derivatives or basing of different forms of smart contracts, and doing things like automatic market making and crypto collateral based derivatives. So that's quite a lot of things which may happen due to RGB. It's a bit fortuitous that we have Dave Harding, who's joined us today, as not only did he do the write-up for the newsletter on this topic this week, but he also engaged in the mailing list discussion. So, Dave, I've monopolized the question so far. Perhaps you have some clarifying comments and, and questions for Maxim. I'm just here to learn. I guess one question I have for Maxim is one of the things I noticed looking through your code is at least the code from the LMP BP Association, and I may be looking at the wrong code, is that you guys use an Electrum backend a lot. And when I was thinking through the protocol, it seems to me that it's something that requires sort of random access to the entire blockchain. So a traditional Bitcoin wallet can use something like an electric backend and it, it's really convenient in that case that way it can go and just ask the electron server to give it any output from any previous transaction and I, i'm saying this for our listeners i know maxim knows all this stuff the downside of that approach is that the person who runs the electron server has to go through the entire blockchain has to maintain a copy of the entire blockchain has to build a very large index of every output in the blockchain. And over time, as the blockchain grows, there's just more and more data that they need to store. Their index gets bigger. They need a beefier server. So one of the things that Bitcoin developers, when thinking about the regular on-chain protocol, have done is try to make sure we continue to design the protocol in a way that we don't depend on something like Electron servers. So a self-custody wallet today can use something like BIP15758 compact block filters. And they can just grab these small filters for the entire blockchain and they can find which blocks contain a transaction they have. And there's other things that they can do to just minimize the amount of data that they need. And any wallet that scans through a block can just lose that block. So a pruned full node can have a wallet without storing any historic blockchain state. So one of my questions here for Maxim is, when I look at the RGP protocol, it, it feels to me like it might depend, or at least certain applications depend on having random access to the entire blockchain state. Is that actually a requirement? Am I just making that up? And what are the implications for the scalability of the protocol? Yeah, David, thank you very much for looking deep inside the code, actually, and the write-up that you've done. I think it's it's great. You was able to explain things in more simple words than I was able to. And now, specifically to your question, no, RGB do not depend on the Electrum. It is true that the current library, they default to Electrum implementation. Why? Well, because it's most commonly used infrastructural thing. But the whole code of RGB is abstracted from a specific, we call it, transaction resolver through the interfaces. And RGB does the verification interacting with the transaction resolver provided by a specific wallet implementation, such that user has ability to change the transaction resolver. Technically, the information we need from Bitcoin blockchain can be provided today by three main backends. Bitcoin Core itself, or any alternative Bitcoin implementation that exposes Bitcoin Core RPC API, Electrum server, as well as a modification of Electrum server called Explorer made by Blockstream, which provides HTTP interface as well, which is more efficient than a usual Electrum interface. We are also working on a thing called BP node, Bitcoin protocol node, which will be a new type of indexer 
capable of doing much faster, in providing much faster responses to the requests from wallets on both Bitcoin related things, lightning related things and RGB related things, such that for instance, you can ask this backend to monitor specific wallet descriptor, which includes some mini scripts, complex mini scripts, time locks and so on. And it will be updating you about new transactions happening to that descriptor. However, BP Note, it's a Rust project. It's still a work in progress, so it's not being released. But potentially, it would be the, one of the best ways of backends blockchain indexers for RGB as well. Okay, so just to, to follow up, and I don't know that this is not super important. I'm just curious here, and, and we have you on the line. So I'm thinking about one of your recent emails. You had these things called state extensions you were describing that are kind of disconnected from other contracts. Right? They're, they're published on the chain or, or they're committed to on chain, but they're disconnected, I believe, from the rest of the contract state. And in the example we were talking about on the mailing list, we have a party who needs to uh, do a proof of publication that they were the first to find a result. So they need to, they need to publish something on chain to establish its time point, if you will, when it occurred, that they were the first to do this. And it just seemed to me from that perspective that a, a later client who needs to go back in time and validate the history is going to need to find that it's going to need to look through the entire blockchain to see if anybody else published something first. And for that, I think you would need complete access to the blockchain and for it to be fast when the blockchain is several hundred gigabytes, you'd kind of need this random access. Am am I missing something? Is this just because it's a, a, a special case? So most RGP wouldn't need to do this, but in a special case, you might need to do this. Can you, can you help me think through this? Yes, sure. Let me start with the state ex- extensions. State extensions are the way how open public unknown set of participants may participate in existing RGB contract. The introduction allowed us to move from the concept when only existing predefined set of participants participate the contract into an open set of participants, which may be important for the cases which you mentioned. And in fact, these state extensions are disconnected from blockchain. They do not require any on-chain event to happen. However, every, anything produced with the state extensions are not finalized, are not final, until one of the contract participants have included the state extension produced by somebody else into the history of the contract. And by doing this inclusion, basically linking it to blockchain state. The second part of your question is actually unrelated to state extensions. And it was that you can construct RGB contracts which use on-chain events as a way of signaling of something. And this is actually because in my reply, it was put together with the state extensions. But in fact, these two things are unconnected. You can have on-chain signaling without state extensions as well. And you can have state extensions without any form of on-chain signaling. And yes, you're right that on-chain signaling may require a random blockchain access. But the reality is that it is up to the contract creator and developer to choose a specific form of on-chain signaling. RGB at its consensus level doesn't require on-chain signaling and doesn't provide a default way of on-chain signaling. Thus, it will be up to the contract creator to select an on-chain form of on-chain signaling which will be efficient in terms of speed and time. Otherwise, its contract wouldn't be used much by the users because it will be slow or not working with their electron backends. So with RG, with this BP node I was mentioning, of course, one of the things we will be providing is more efficient blockchain indexes which allow this random blockchain state access. And with this, probably a thing we call... Uh, fast forward updates to RGB, it's a way how you can introduce new functionality into RGB protocol. We will have a more functions which allow introspection of the Bitcoin blockchain. As of the current version, version 0.10, there is no random blockchain access in RGB is allowed. 
However, with a, one of the future updates, the random blockchain access will come, which will enable this form of signaling. And the specific forms which will come will depend on our progress with the BP node and efficient blockchain indexing. That answers my question very well. Thank you. Mike? So the, the announcement from the mailing list talked about this version 0 0.10 release. I, I think a lot of this discussion on um, RGB at a high level is, is important for folks, but I also didn't want to miss anything that you thought was notable for folks about this version 0 0.10 release at a high level. So maybe get, give an opportunity to, to tell folks what's updated and what they should consider if, if they've used previous versions, et cetera. Yes, sure. Version 0 0.10, probably one of the largest changes in RGB, which we, we've been working on for more than half of the year. And it also includes some functionality which was thought and contemplated for several previous years. Specifically, this release allows a thing we call interfaces. Interfaces fully abstract the functionality of the smart contract uh, such that now, when you have a wallet supporting RGB and somebody does a non-standard smart contract, the users of the wallet do not need to up update their software to use a new kind of smart contract. What they can do is that together with the contract, they import an interface and implementation of the interface created by the contract developer. And now their wallet supports a new forms of the contract. So it allows you to do very advanced stuff, not being blocked by the vendors, by the wallet developers, by us as association defining some sort of standards. Any independent developer can do whatever they like with RGB without asking permission, filing standard, or talking to wallet developers. And it will be up to the end users who will be installing this contract, reading who did this, and if they trust developer, they can plug in this interface thing. Another very important news is that now you can write RGB smart contracts and Rust, and you have access to a rich type system. The state of the smart contract can be any complex data type you can write in Rust, and then you can compile this data type into your smart contract. I think this is also quite a huge step forward. We are working on a specific, special programming language called Contractum, which is Haskell-style functional language to program RGB smart contracts. But it's, uh, the compiler is not yet released. And before this language is created, actually writing smart contracts in Rust is the main and the only available, well, main way we assume smart contracts will be written. There is another one which you can use a low-level assembly called Alluvium assembly, but uh, this is much harder than Rust, so probably Rust is was quite a big innovation. One follow-up question regarding, so we talked about this latest version, we talked about the history of RGB. Can you comment briefly on the RGB project's roadmap? Maybe, maybe just a, a few things that you're looking forward to and, and near near-term releases? Mm, yes, RGB made in a layered way. So the main layer of RGB is the consensus layer, which we tend to move towards classification. So less and less things would happen with the consensus layer. And the thing that is released in version 0 0.10 is well, the most stable release we had so far. There is not much things going to happen there, but for sure, some of them will be evolving in the future, including the one that we already mentioned, which is a random blockchain access. There will be also an access to the state of the lightning channels. And there will also be more advanced use of zero knowledge proofs, including bullet proofs plus plus range proofs, and including potentially zero knowledge based version of the history of the contract. That's pretty much everything that may happen in this layer. And the main innovation with RGB would be happening on the layer above, which is a standard library and wallet integrations, where we plan and tool chain for the developers. And the most exciting things there are, first, more deep and advanced integration of RGB with the Lightning Network, 
which will allow doing many, many things not possible before. This also requires some changes and improvements to the Lightning Network protocol itself. We are working on them, and we are naming this extended version of Lightning Network protocol Bfrost. And it is important to get things like multi-peer channels working. We also work on channel composability such that you can construct channels inside channels inside channels. That is more than channels factories because the structure of the channel itself will be composable of different components. Like you can add a DLC outputs to the channel or you can use non-standard forms of outputs and so on. So it's, it's a standard protocol that adds this composability to Lightning channels. Combined with the RGB, it will allow these multiple channels which can operate in a very fast and efficient way with RGB smart contracts uh, off-chain, not requiring mining transactions for that complex operations. Another thing we are excited is this contractum language and contractum compiler, which should help people to write RGB contracts and starting exploring this new world. And the very last thing that was to mention is that in a very long-term perspective, it would take years for sure from now, we are working on a creation of a new layer one medium. I don't want to call it blockchain because it's not actually a blockchain anymore. It's a way how you can run client-side validation with a layer one in the most efficient way where instead of block, you have a one signature, which includes a lot, a lot of commitments. And of course, this layer doesn't feature any coin, any cryptocurrency, nothing of that sort. And with that, as I described in the latest uh, my reply to Bitcoin Dev mail list, it would be possible for RGB to operate on both on Bitcoin and this new medium such that Bitcoin can be lifted or moved into RGB from the main chain and operating on the new medium with this client-side validation, which will unlock much larger scalability that is possible with blockchain or even with the Lightning Network today. Dave, any follow-up questions before we move on? I just wanted to see if Maxim wanted to provide a little bit more details on their plans for confidential transaction-based amount blind, because I thought it was actually really clever when I read about that, how they're going to use that to improve privacy. That's already used. So what we are using is we are using this technology developed by originally Blockstream guys, which is confidential transactions, where we use Pedersen commitments to hide the amount of the asset. Together with the Pedersen commitment, we have to use a range proof. So we stick to bulletproofs. It was in RGB until this version. In this version, for now, we temporarily not creating bulletproofs, and we still use Pedersen commitments, but the data are kept in the explicit amounts such that when a new Bulletproof version, which is Bulletproof++, plus plus, will arrive, we will be able to pack the history and blind all past data with this new Bulletproof++. Plus plus. So that would be one of the next updates of RGB. We are waiting for Bulletproof++ plus plus to be finished because they are not finished in their implementation. It's just a paper which is being implemented by Blockstream as of today. And when that implementation would be completed, we will be able to migrate all existing smart contracts on the use of Bulletproofs and the confidential transactions will become the default way of passing amounts around and also they will be applied to all historical data as well. Yeah, so I thought that was really cool when you have one party giving a future party the past state, they don't have to tell the future party anything about the specific amounts transferred in the previous states. So if Mike gave me some tokens or some lifted BTC and I gave it to Maxim, Maxim would have no idea how much Mike and I transferred. He would still, Maxim would still be able to do a full validation of the client-side validation of the previous state transfers to make sure everything was correct, but he wouldn't learn any of the amounts. So I thought that was really, really awesome. I have one last question, a, a kind of a general question from Maxim, which was, when you're working on an RGP contract, how much do you need to be aware of uh, how the protocol works at the base layer? So the Bitcoin protocol, I'm thinking kind of in comparison to, say, an Ethereum developer writing their contract in Solidity 
and not really thinking through everything. And so their contract is exploitable by like minor extractable value or, you know, these other things that happen in Ethereum because you think the entire contract is the code that you're writing in Solidity or whatever. If you're writing an RGB contract, do you need to be very aware about how UTXOs happen on Bitcoin, how reorgs happen on Bitcoin, what miners do for transaction selection, or when you're running an RGB contract, can you just write the code and it's, you know, as long as your code is good, it's gonna, it's gonna work. So what's your take on that, Maxim? One of the things we're constantly thinking about is not to repeat Ethereum story and not to create Ethereum 2.0 on Bitcoin. Well, the time will show have we succeeded in that or not. Of course, I think it's impossible to do a system which is absolutely safe, such that uh, somebody dumb or with a bad intentions wouldn't be able to do something wrong with that. So I think nobody is protected from this. However, what we try to do is that, as you asked, when you develop RGB contract, you don't have to think about reworks and low-level things in Bitcoin blockchain itself. They are fully abstracted and the system operates in the same way for all the smart contracts. So all the validation of on-chain data is performed exactly the same and you don't program that part. Another thing that we did to improve the reliability and and make the coding more simple is that we have these languages that we are developing, they are functional style, meaning that they are more declarative rather than imperative. And when you use a declarative model of programming, it's much harder to do something wrong. The last part, which is very important, is that we very clearly define the concept of ownership of a state or the data. One of the main pitfalls of Ethereum is the use of account-based model, such that when you write a smart contract, you must always make sure that you check who is the owner and who is the right to perform and execute that or that operation and how this operation should happen. And people are frequently forgetting about making these checks or they are making them in an, in, in an improper way. With RGB, you are not worried about that. You don't do that because everything is linked to the UTXO. And UTXO actually defines who is the owner and only the owner has the right to perform operation and that right is not checked by RGB itself. It is checked by the fact that you are able as an owner to spend that UTXO with a Bitcoin transaction. So in this way, we just literally leveraging the existing Bitcoin as a state ownership system, not reinventing the wheel and not doing anything of the sort that Ethereum had to do with this account-based model. So this is the good point. The bad, about, the bad thing about that is that, of course, it requires a huge paradigm ch- change when you try to develop something with RGB. You just can't come from Ethereum and Solidity world and write RGB contract because it's not that you can't cross-compile EVM to RGB. Even more, you can't develop the contracts using the same paradigms that I used to develop contracts in uh, Ethereum. So that's one of the reasons why people frequently say that something is not possible with RGB and uh, trying to apply the same logic of Ethereum to RGB and Bitcoin. Of course, it wouldn't be possible because with that logic, it is not possible by definition. But, however, it is possible if you change the way how you see the state management, the smart contracting, and when you move to a new programming paradigm, many things become much simpler. They don't require a lot of effort, like in Ethereum. In many cases, when in Ethereum you need to create a token here, you don't need to do that. And where in Ethereum you need to control the access rights here, you don't need to do that, and so on and so forth. So... That's probably the recap of programming on RGB. Thank you. As we wrap up here, Maxim, if folks are interested more about RGB and potentially contributing and maybe even potentially donating to the project's efforts, where would you direct folks? Uh, Well, I think the main place to read about the technology is RGB Tech website, which we will be keeping updated. Of course, the best place to contribute and to go deeply is GitHub, RGBWG workgroup organization. 
There is also a way to donate through the GitHub, but GitHub takes its share. Another option is to just connect to us, or send an email to info at lmp-bp.org, and we will provide you a BTC Pay address and uh, BTC Pay server address and stuff like that. So the best way to contribute, go to GitHub. The best way to learn, go to rgb.tech. We will be also releasing a white paper, we call it black paper, <laughs> as a joke, because comparing to existing white papers, it doesn't offer any token, it doesn't contain a lot of marketing information, and it's very focused on the confidentiality, so that's why it's a black paper, which would be probably the main resource once it's released to learn RGB in depth before starting contributing to the code base. Well, thank you, Maxim, for joining us to explain this news item and all things RGB. Hopefully, we can keep you on for just a minute longer, as I think this next update does involve some work that you or, or your, your team has done. So if you hang on for just one more minute, we can get sure, your opinion sure. on that. Next segment of the newsletter this week involved our monthly feature on changes to services and client software, where we look around at the ecosystem and, and see what wallets or services or libraries are implementing interesting Bitcoin technology that we cover on the Optech website. The first entry is Descriptor Wallet Library adding a block explorer. And coincidentally, Descriptor Wallet Library is a, affiliated with some of the work that Maxim has been doing. It's a Rust descriptor-based wallet library that builds on Rust Bitcoin and supports a bunch of cool Bitcoin tech, including descriptors, miniscript, PSBTs, and in the most recent couple releases, a text-based block explorer. And Maxim, maybe you can briefly explain Descriptor Wallet Library and the Block Explorer that was recently added. Yeah, the Descriptor Wallet Library is the library we did at LMPPP Association. So we have basically three main directions, Bitcoin implementations and libraries, Lightning implementations and libraries, and RGB. And it was created to be used, it was used by RGB and uh, Lightning implementation we also had. And this new version, it brings ability to parse to upload specific control blocks because we found out that it is impossible with any existing Bitcoin Explorer today, including Mempool, to look into the witness data of the Taproot Path script spendings. And for developers, it's quite crucial to understand what's in there. And this command line tool is pretty pretty simple in terms of user interfaces, but what it allows you is you just pass the transaction ID and you can look into Taproot witness details, which can be very helpful for those who work with the Taproot. Dave, any questions or comments? Nope, that just sounds like an awesome feature set. The way I've been doing that is just by hand parsing the hex. So it would be very nice to have a tool to do that for me. Glad to help. Maxim, you're welcome to stay on and comment on the rest of the newsletter as we go through it. But if you have things that you need to do, you're free to drop as well. Thank you. I'll say you online. Next change to client and service software that we noted this month is Stratum V2 reference implementation update announced. And maybe we haven't discussed Stratum V2 too much on this show previously, so it might make sense to give a quick overview of Stratum V2's features. So there's a Stratum V1, which is essentially a protocol for facilitating communication between miners and mining pools. And that version one has been out for a long time. And there's this V2 that is being worked on currently. Some improvements for V2 include that the version two is actually a more standardized protocol when compared to Stratum V1. Stratum V1 was less precisely defined and it resulted in different implementations having semi-compatibility with one another. So V2 helps tighten that up a bit. A second feature is, is one that probably most people are excited about when they hear Stratum V2, which is the ability for an individual miner within a mining pool setup, as opposed to just the centralized pool operator, being able to select transactions to include in a candidate block. So I think that's what most people are excited about, but there are some other improvements as well. Default encryption and using the noise protocol authentication for 
protection against man in the middle attacks. There are some performance improvement, including data transfer optimizations. And finally, the V2 is being rolled out in a flexible way, allowing a variety of different configurations, including involvement of Stratum V1 mining devices to be able to participate in, in certain V2 Stratum setups. And the latest post, which is the one that we highlighted in this segment of the newsletter, is about a new Stratum V2 reference implementation. And that includes the piece that I mentioned previously a minute ago about individual miners' ability to select the transactions that would go into a candidate block. So if you're a miner or part of a pool or a firmware maker, you should be looking at this and being able to provide some feedback to the project because they note in this post that that feedback will, quote, have a high impact on the development direction. Dave, any thoughts on Stratum V2 in this reference implementation? Well, you can put me part of the people who just love the idea of enabling miners, the people who are actually providing the hash rate, to choose the transactions that are being included in the blocks, not leaving that to a pool level decision. And one of the things that is really nifty about that that I don't hear often much is that it may actually slightly improve the pool's profitability. One of the reasons for that is the the miner who finds a block in an existing protocol where they don't choose the transactions, they have to send the winning hash back to the pool. The pool has to add that to the block template they created, and then the pool broadcasts out that block. Whereas if the miner is running a local node and they're using Stratum V2, when they find that winning hash for the block, they can block hash that block directly. They also send the hash back to the mining pool, and the mining pool does all the things I just described. But the miner who finds the winning block can be the first one to broadcast it. It removes a little bit of latency. We're talking, you know, for a typical miner, somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds, probably, maybe a bit less. But that's a, that's a somewhat significant amount when we have an average of 10 minutes between blocks. You can do the math. I think it improves profitability like, you know, maybe 0.01%, somewhere on that order. But that's something when a block is worth 50000 or I don't know what they're worth now, $100,000. So it's, a, it's just it's a really nice that miners and pools have worked together on this and that there are people out there sponsoring this like Square and whatnot. Thanks for adding that point, Dave. That's something that... If I had heard about it previously, I don't recall that. And so that's an interesting additional benefit. The next piece of software that we highlighted in this month's coverage is Liana 0.4 being released. We covered the 0.1 and 0.2 releases previously. And to just give a quick recap of what Liana is, it's wallet software that features a recovery key. And so the, the typical case for this might be if you lose access to your keys for whatever reason, you can have some sort of a, a fallback for that that includes a time lock so that if that's a different set of keys that that person or that those group of people cannot move your Bitcoins until some sort of a timeout has been reached. And they've been iterating on this approach for the last few releases. And this 0.4 release allows the possibility to configure additional time lock recovery paths. And so an example from the blog post that we linked to would be, let my funds only be spendable by myself for one year. And if they don't move for a year, let them be spendable by my spouse and children along with an attorney. And then after a year and three months without the funds moving, let them be spendable by my family alone. And they, the Liana team notes in the write-up that that would obviate any potential attorney that is non-compliant or inaccessible or malicious by having a second fallback to just have the family be able to move the coins after an additional time lock. So that's interesting. Dave, did you get a chance to look at the Liana release? 
I did not. I just quickly skimmed the notes while you were talking. One of the things that I would I would quickly mention here, which is not Leanna specific, but as the ecosystem rolls out support for descriptors and miniscript, it's going to be a lot easier to make these policies portable from one wallet to the next. So you'll be able to have a tool like Liana that helps you choose these policies, helps you build these policies, you know, with a nice user interface and whatnot. And then you're going to be able to copy that into a different wallet. And, and those wallets might share a path or they might not share an HT path. You know, they might be completely separate, but you'll I, I think that we're looking at a future where we're going to have more access to these sort of, you know, simple policies for defining how to use your coins. And it's going to make everything so much more robust, you know, in, when it comes to the security of your Bitcoins and safety of your Bitcoins across, you know, life events. The next notable software release was Zeus adding fee bumping features. And this is in Zeus 0.7.4 adding fee bumping using both RBF and CPFP. And that includes for regular on-chain transactions, but also including lightning channel opening and lightning channel closing transactions. And they, this update includes a lot of the plumbing for a bunch of different backends, but the first implementation here being LND. And I messaged Evan Kaloudis who works on the Zeus project to make sure I understood accurately what was going on. And he confirmed that typically this fee bumping uses RBF, but it can also use CPFP in certain situations. So there's some logic and flexibility in these fee bumping scenarios. Dave, any comments? Fee bumping is great. It's something that we need in the future. Did we skip the cold card update? Yes, I did unintentionally. And of course, Rodolfo's here, so now I'm embarrassed. Yeah, it's the cold card firmware supporting additional SIG hash flag. So to set the stage, a SIG hash flag is something that you can use to indicate which part of the transaction is signed by a signature. And most typically, SIG hash all is the SIG hash flag that's used, which is sign all inputs and outputs. But Dave, maybe I can throw a question to you. What, what's an example usage of a SIG hash flag that isn't SIG hash all? There's... There's two other main flags, which one is SIG hash none, which by default, if I recall correctly, that only signs the input to the transaction. It doesn't sign any of the outputs. And then there's SIG hash single, where the signature only covers input that adds it and the corresponding output. So if you if you're use SIG hash single on the second input, it also covers the second output. And there's another, there's a modifier called sick hash anyone can pay, which just makes this all more complicated. A sick hash single is really interesting, and it's something that they're actually using in Lightning right now. What you can do with it is kind of do multiple transactions together. So you have an input that's, let's say it contributes one Bitcoin to a transaction, and you expect to receive 0 0.9 Bitcoin in change where you just make sure your input and your change are in the same position in the transaction and the other 0 0.1 bitcoin that it contributes can be spent by any of the other outputs so you can take this transaction you can hand it to somebody else and you can say hey look you pay fees now 0 0.1 bitcoin is way too much for fees but you get the idea there is that you can just pass around these transactions and your parts are protected by your signature. Nobody can take that transaction and make sure and prevent you from receiving that 0 0.9 Bitcoin, but they can also go and add their own inputs and outputs. The last piece of software that we highlighted in this week's newsletter is Floresta. And this is an Electrum protocol compatible server that uses U3XO on the server side to decrease the, the server's resource requirements. And right now we noted in the newsletter that this software currently only is supported on the Signet test network. But I think we can break down a couple pieces of the technology that are in this project. The first being U3XO which is an alternative to storing the entire UTXO set. And instead you store a Merkle tree that's up updated after each block. And that has some significant decreases in the amount of disk space needed to run a node. And so this project has married UTXO with the Electrum protocol that we discussed a bit earlier, which is a client server protocol that allows lightweight wallets to connect to a server that can provide information that supports that 
Light Wallet's operation. And something notable from the blog post that introduces this project is it sounds like they initially set out to create a node that also included a wallet, but realized that there's a bunch of work and overhead with creating and maintaining a wallet and instead decide, decided to create a U3XO-based Electrum server and then let folks use whatever wallet they wanted that could speak the Electrum protocol. The project also noted that it requires significantly less disk IO and disk space even more so than a prune node using Electrum Personal Server. And another thing notable from their blog post is that they noted if you're okay with the trade-offs of Assume UTXO, you can actually have Assume UTXO full node running on your smartphone. So I thought that was interesting. Dave, what are your thoughts? I think I should have clicked on this earlier. I'm a little confused how it works, but... I think this could be kind of a, a really nice thing. So uh, it looks like it's kind of a replacement for or, or, or an alternative to Electrum Personal Server. That's a, that's a little client that you run beside your Bitcoin full node that finds just your transactions using Bitcoin Core and serves them to you over the Electrum protocol. So if you want to run a full Electrum server, as we were talking with Maxim earlier, or, or something like Electrum or whatever, you have to build this really beefy index. I think your, your Bitcoin Core client plus your Electrum server, you're probably looking at at least a terabyte of data. Maybe it's like two terabytes now. I don't know what it is. But with Electrum personal server, you just store the transact you just store the data related to your transactions so it's it's basically the size of your wallet on your full node so it's it's very efficient the one of the problems with electron personal server is if you decide to in your client wallet load a new wallet that has history going back before the current block you kind of have to go through the entire blockchain again and scan things and that's especially painful for a pruned node. But if you have Utrixo, you might be able to request out to another Utrixo server. They have names for these. I can't remember what they are. But a, a data server in Utrixo protocol. And they can provide you just the information you need connected to the Utrixo root. So it'll be fully authenticated data. It'll be, you know, your full node will have verified every transaction in its history. You'll know this data that you're receiving from the the server you're calling out to is correct and valid. So there's no like S2X fork going on there. But your your Utrixo based Electrum personal server will be able to serve your wallet data. Again, I, I'm a little confused from this announcement exactly how it works, so I'm going to have to look at that in detail, but I think this is pretty cool. They do mention that when you first connect your wallet to the server, the, the Bitcoin balance will show up as zero, and that's even if you have Bitcoins in your wallet. And that's because this Esta tool doesn't keep an address index like Electrum or Electris. You, you actually need to provide the wallet's XPUB to the server to create an index for your UTXOs. I'm sure there's a bunch more, more detail as well in there. So check out the GitHub, check out the blog post to learn more, but it's interesting. And for folks who are curious about more about UTXO, look back a couple episodes and we had Calvin Kim on talking about UTXO and some of the details there that could be informative for you. Moving on to the releases and release candidates section of the newsletter, we have BDK 0.28.0, which we've covered in the last slew of newsletter updates, but this is not an alpha or you know, a test release. It's the official BDK 0.28.0. And we actually had Post on who gave us a great overview of BDK 0.28.0 and some of the BDK core work that has been going on and the changes to the project as a result of adding that BDK core functionality to BDK itself. So look back a few episodes. I don't have the number on hand to get a more detailed breakdown of this particular release. Just to clarify, I don't believe this release includes the BDK core update. I think this is 
still from their mainline branch, and it's it's just a maintenance release. So some of their underlying libraries from the Rust Bitcoin project changed how they did stuff, and it's some Rust specific thing that I didn't look into details for. And so BDK had to kind of release or to put in some bug fixes and to update their version of those previous those underlying libraries. They had to do the same thing that those underlying libraries did, something related to a standard function in Rust. So this is just a maintenance release. BDK project, I believe, is still working on the release for the BDK core, you know, changing how they do their modules and stuff. So just want to clarify there. Thanks, Dave. I was wondering why that wasn't in the release notes when I clicked in. So thank you for clarifying. I know that is an effort that that is underway. And so if you are curious about that effort, check out that previous chat with Alicos. The next two releases that we noted are both Core Lightning releases. The Core Lightning 23.02.2, which is a maintenance release that contains a bunch of bug fixes. And if I recall correctly, the the numbering on these releases has to do with the the month and year that it was released. So this is a maintenance release that is based on that February 2023 release, um, and it's a bug fix release. Dave, did you want to jump into any of the details of that release? Nah, I think it's just little stuff. If if you use Core Lightning, especially if you use it as a developer in other applications, just check the release notes. They're like five lines, so you'll be good. Core Lightning 23.05 release candidate one. So back to that numbering scheme, this would be appeared to be the, the target for the May release of 2023. And it's release candidate for Core Lightning. I digging in, I did not find the anything notable. I didn't find the release notes immediately, so I don't have anything to comment on it. Dave, I don't know if you, you drilled into that at all. Not really. So just for, for listeners, our usual policy for announcing pre-releases, you know, release candidates, is not to go in too much detail for stuff unless it's something that really the developers want tested, that they, they have a specific desire to have something tested. That way we don't kind of steal their thunder from their main release announcement. You know, so they, they want to say, look, we just added this awesome feature, but Optech told you about it a month ago. You know, so we don't want to do that. So we don't usually go into too much details. Anybody who does want to read the changelog, especially if you're going to go out there and you're going to test it, it's in the main directory of the Core Lightning project. So you just go to the, the page that has a readme and scroll down the list of files, and there's a changelog.md there. We have three notable code and documentation changes that we pulled out for this week's newsletter. The first one is Bitcoin Core 27358, which is an update to the verified Python script. If folks have downloaded Bitcoin Core previously, you know that it's a best practice to verify the the files of a particular release. And there's been some changes recently in where certain signatures are from prominent Bitcoin developers and other folks. And there's some improvements to the script to automate the process of checking that. Dave, you did the write-up. Do you want to get into some of the the nitty-gritty of of how this improves verification for folks who are downloading the software? Absolutely. I think this is a this is a very very useful change. So in the past, when the Bitcoin Core project released a new version, they put the software up on their website and they had the lead maintainer, Vladimir Vandalan sign it with his GPG key. So he would sign a file that had a hash of all the specific files. So you could download his signature, you could download that file that he signed, and you could verify that file was signed by him, and then you could check the checksums on the, the specific file you downloaded for Linux or for Windows or for Mac or whatever. And this is how a lot of free software projects you know, give you a verifiable artifact from their project. So you know that, that it's actually legit software. Bitcoin Core goes a step further. They, they also do reproducible builds. So multiple people can all build from the same source code and get exactly the same files. They're gonna have the same hashes. So they're all gonna be able to communicate with each other and verify that the build is good and that they're all getting the same thing and that they, you know, they can test the software if they want to. And, but, you know, Bitcoin, we don't really want to put trust in one person. You know, we love Vladimir. He left as lead maintainer 
And, you know, we have this opportunity now not to put our trust in this one person. So now multiple people who are doing the reproducible bills, they're all signing those reproducible bills. Those signatures are out there and you can go through and choose the people who you personally trust or exclude the people who you don't trust and check their signatures on each release. But this is, this is a pretty laborious process. You've got to download each signature. You've got to run a GPG command. You've got to download the, the files. It's kind of a pain. So several developers work together. I believe the, the final developer on here was Corey Fields, but else did Andrew Chow did a lot of the, the initial work there on running this script that just goes through and automates everything. So what you do is you tell it uh, the PGB keys of the people you trust. So if you trust Andrew Trow, you know, you download his key and you tell the script, I trust Andrew. And you go find a few other people who you trust who signed this file. And you give that to the program. The program goes and downloads their signatures. It downloads the release files, and it verifies that the signatures commit to the release file. So it's this process that you can do manually, but is now automated. So if you're willing to read through this script, and it looks like it's sensible Python code, you can use it to automate a process that you should be doing anyway. And again, Bitcoin Core here has now done something nice that it has removed trust in any individual developer. So pretty cool. And not only can you go to the Bitcoin core slash geeks.sigs repository and see these geeks attestations for different releases of Bitcoin core, but you too can also do a build and an attestation and put up a pull request so that your attestation is also included. I know in, in the past, developers have, have been wanting to solicit the community's involvement in these sorts of attestations. So if you're feeling geeky, if you will, you can also contribute your attestation. The next pull request that we noted this week was Core Lightning 6120, improving its transaction replacement logic. And this is around RBF fee bumping a transaction and also includes periodically rebroadcasting unconfirmed transactions to make sure they're relayed. Maybe one in to, to digging into this PR would, would be for me to ask Dave, wh why would we need to be rebroadcasting unconfirmed transactions? Isn't that handled by Bitcoin Core? Alas, it is not handled by Bitcoin Core particularly well, especially if you don't have a wallet running with Bitcoin Core. So and, and the way Core Lightning does is it doesn't use Bitcoin Core's native wallet. It uses its own wallet. So when you send a transaction to Bitcoin Core, it sees if it already has a copy of it. It makes sure it's valid. And then it will relay it to all of its full peer connections, the, the ones that aren't blocks, only connections. And then it just sits around in its mempool and hopes that it gets confirmed. The problem is if you're reeling a transaction that you created with other local software on your computer and you send it to your peers, well, what if your those were just a bad set of peers? What if you had just started your Bitcoin full node and you didn't have any peers? What if, you know, something else happened and those peers that received the transaction didn't relay it to any other peers? Then the whole network hasn't seen your transaction. And, you know, in the Lightning Protocol, it's really important to get your transaction out there and get it into a block within a reasonable amount of time. If you're just sending a regular transaction, you know, your recipient might just say, hey, look, I'm not going to give you the goods that you bought until I receive your transaction. And that's just not a big problem. You can resend it. But with Core Lightning, you really need to have some mechanism out there doing its best to get your transaction confirmed. So this this pull request helps take care of both sides of that problem. First, it relays the, it rebroadcasts the transaction. The current, the current rule they have is to just rebroadcast it every hour. And there are trade-offs there. I think we've discussed this in previous newsletters. The trade-off there is the more you rebroadcast the transaction, the easier it is for somebody monitoring the network to intuit that that, that transaction belongs to your wallet. 
And the real solution for this is for us to build broadcasting, rebroadcasting into Bitcoin Core directly so that all nodes occasionally rebroadcast transactions. So you can't tell that somebody rebroadcasting a transaction is behaving any different than other nodes. But we don't have that yet. Core Lightning is taking a sensible precaution here. And in addition to rebroadcasting a transaction, they've also put in some rules for automatically fee bumping a transaction using replace by fee. Again, lightning transactions need to be confirmed within a timely amount of time. And I think if you're interested in rules for automatic fee bumping, Rusty Russell has put those, I think they're in a commit message on this PR. So scan through the commit messages and oh no, they're in the, the main PR description. It's, I think they're, they're reasonably well thought out rules. Even if Rusty uses this weird measurement he calls SIPA, which I believe most people call, I don't know, weight units. I think, I, think it's, I think this is weight units. Okay. But yeah, Rusty is the only person who does this, and it makes reading his stuff extra fun. Anyway, there's some, there's some rules here. If you're doing other software like this where you want to do automatic feed bumping, check out his rules. I think they're well thought out, and they can, they can help you save some thinking time. Last PR this week is to the Eclair repository, 2584, adding support for splicing, both splicing in, adding funds to an existing channel, and splicing out, taking funds out of a channel to an on-chain transaction. There was some notes in the PR that there are some differences between what Eclair has done and the current draft specification, which leads me to ask, Dave, if you're familiar, if I'm an Eclair user, am I able to start splicing in and splicing out now? I thought that we needed more implementations to, to be supporting that on mainnet in order for that to be live. What's the, what's the status of the usability of this feature that's been merged? Well, they have not merged the protocol under the specification. And what Eclair is describing here, like we note in the newsletter, differs slightly from the current proposal. And I don't believe it's 100% compatible with what Core Lightning is doing. In particular, one of the things they mentioned in the pull request description is their words. They said they use a poor man's quiescence protocol, whereas I happen to know the, the Bolt proposal is based on a, a previous proposal Rusty made for what he calls the STFU you can figure out what that stands for, quiescence protocol, where a, a, a node sends an STFU message that tells other nodes, okay, stop sending me updates to this channel. Don't send me any new HTLCs until I finish the operation I'm about to work on. That's important in splicing because in splicing, as I think was mentioned in a previous news newsletter where you had Lisa Nigut on, in splicing, we have they manage parallel commitment transactions. So because you have to manage the stuff in parallel, you want to start out from everybody having exactly the same state. And once you all agree on that state, then you can resume the protocol and go back to just doing things in your merry way. So this differs from the vacation proposal. It differs from what I believe is currently in Core Lightning or is in a, 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 dra a PR for Core Lightning that just the Detmer, I think is his name, is working on. The difference is not big. And I think with this, if you want to run a pre-release version, you know, a non-released version of Eclair, you can open Splices with other Eclair programs. I don't think this is gated behind an experimental flag or anything, but I'm not entirely that familiar with Eclair. So this is, this is exciting. I just want to say that I think exploiting, splicing is really an important feature for Lightning because it just allows you to hide from user the difference between on-chain Bitcoin and off-chain Bitcoin. From the perspective of a user, once splicing is widely deployed, there's just Bitcoin. There's Bitcoin that you can send, you have to wait for confirmations, and there's Bitcoin that you can send and you don't have to wait for confirmations, which is it's still a difference, but the, the user interface and the usability just increases massively with Lightning. So I'm really happy to see Eclair working on this. I'm happy to see Core Lightning working on this. I'm going to just be really happy to see this get out there and be deployed. Before we wrap up for, for this week, I want to give opportunity to folks who have any questions for Dave or I, or I see 
Maxim is still here on anything that we've covered in the newsletter. Feel free to raise your hand or request speaker access. And I will also plug newsletter number 246, both the written version and our podcast recap of it from last week. We did have Lisa on and we talked about not only some of the splicing specification discussions that have happened recently, but also more broadly, what's happening with splicing, what's the time frame, and what are the advantages of splicing. So if you're more curious about splicing, definitely check out that episode as well. I don't see any requests for speaker access or questions on the tweet that I can reference. So I think we're good to wrap up. Thank you to my co-host for this week, Dave Harding. And thank you to our special guest, Maxim, for going through the news item on RGB this week, as well as the, the commentary on the client and services.